Texas in the summer is usually dry as a bone. But not in the summer of 2007. 44 freakish days of rain, including 19 inches in one eight-hour period, flood the eastern part of the state. 13 people are killed. Five are missing. Everything gets missed out. Floods during dry season. Could this be a sign of global warming? Many scientists believe it is, and they're scrambling to find new technologies to hold back the waters. The Army Corps of Engineers is trying to prevent disasters like the one in East Texas, testing state-of-the-art technologies to shore up levees and keep rivers and lakes from overflowing. The rapid deployment flood wall is one of them. The rapid deployment flood wall is like Legos for adults, because all you have to do is connect them side to side and stack them. It takes seven people one hour to build a 100 foot long wall, four foot high. It takes 35 laborers 20 hours to build a sandbag wall that's 100 feet long. We're 100 times faster than sandbags. Faster and stronger. In tests, this lightweight grid withstood 40 hours of pounding waves. That's 72,000 waves. Al Orlanis invented the flood wall, which is made from a clear, reusable plastic. It's based on a very simple idea. If you get a paper cup, turn it over, cut the bottom out, place sand inside the cup, you can stand on it because the sand builds compression. Compacted sand and water are what give concrete its strength. Al took that strength and transferred it to a temporary wall that can hold back overflowing rivers or explosives. That's right, the military is using the flood wall to reinforce bunkers in Iraq. At home, the idea is to stockpile the walls for use in future floods. But compressed sand won't staunch the tides that threaten one of the best known harbors in the world. With rising sea level climate change, much of New York City uh, is low lying. It's on the water's edge, built right at the water's edge. Stony Brook University's Malcolm Bowman worries that the city can't handle the higher seas of a warmer Earth. We can expect the sea in New York to be as high as two and a half feet higher than it is now by the year 2050 or 2075. This may not sound like much, but a 20-foot storm surge on two and a half feet sea level rise is very, very serious. Most tunnels and subway lines would be flooded, as they were in August 2007. And Manhattan would be split at Canal Street, cutting off the financial district from the rest of the city. This is not alarmist thinking. We get oysters every winter. We get hurricanes every fall. If we get a direct hit on New York City here, at high tide, the flooding could be extensive. So Bowman has come up with an audacious plan to save New York City, if only someone would listen. We would need at least three barriers to protect the city of New York and a fourth barrier to protect Jamaica Bay and Kennedy Airport. One would be at the main entrance to the harbor here at the Verrazano Narrows. The second one would be behind Staten Island to stop water leaking in from the ocean. And the third would be up near the Frog's Neck Bridge in the Upper East River, which is the connection of the harbor to Long Island Sound. The city of London, England has had its own storm surge protection since the 1980s. The Thames barrier is open most of the time to allow shipping traffic. The gates only close when a storm is on the way. Bowman envisions something similar for New York, but on a larger scale. The barriers would have to be 40, 45 feet above the water level. If you look at the bridge, the uh, roadway of the bridge is probably 250 feet above the sea. So we're talking about one quarter of the height between the sea and the roadway. It's a big solution, but Bowman thinks there's no smaller way to deal with the new realities of a warming Earth. He's presented the plan to New York City, but the high cost scared the city fathers off. Well, we're costing the billion. It's a large undertaking and would be certainly the largest civil engineering project in the United States. But New Amsterdam can look to old Amsterdam as a model of how to plan big to stem the rising tides. In the Netherlands, flood protection is massive. Just look at the behemoth Maeslund carrying. When the North Sea rises 10 feet above its normal level, the barrier's base floods with water, and two locomobiles push the curved gates toward each other. 
it more or less blocks so that the North Sea water cannot flow into the hinterland and our five to eight million people are protected uh, from the storm surges. My name is Pierre Velenga. I work at Wageningen University uh, studying climate change. Sea level will rise and rainfall will become more intensive and our river will come with peak discharges 20 to 30 percent higher than the present dikes can withstand. The Netherlands is a delta, facing the onslaught of the sea and rivers flowing from Germany and Belgium. It's probably the best protected delta in the world, but now climate change poses a new threat. The major challenge is whether we will be in time to redesign our country and our water systems. Holland's first line of defense is on its coast. In a round-the-clock operation, ships pump sand onto sea beaches to keep the shoreline from eroding. It's messy work, but guided with scientific precision. The scientists at Delft Hydraulics have recreated a North Sea beach in a 160-foot-long flume where they can study how tides move the sand. What you see here is actually a scale model of, of the, the movement of waves and the, the waves back the sand below them. The model helps them determine exactly where to place the newly dredged sand so it's not washed away. For more theoretical work, the hydrologists use computer simulations. These computer models typically simulate what-if scenarios. If the a dike would break at a certain moment when the water is very high in the river or in the sea, what would happen? What you see here is a major break of the sea defense of the Netherlands in the western part of the Netherlands. This is De Haag and this is Rotterdam. This flood is strictly hypothetical, but the model demonstrates a new reality for the vulnerable Dutch. Simply making dikes higher will not be enough in the age of global warming. We may have to accommodate more water, and a bigger part of our country will have to be open water. A project called Room for the Rivers is already clearing and digging out farmland to give the waters of the Rhine a place to spill out. But with some new houses, builders have taken a radically different approach. When the water comes, the house will go up. Hello, my name is uh, Ger Kengen. I'm uh, the designer of these houses here. These houses are built on the riverside of a dike. They rest on the ground, except that is, in the event of a flood. The idea is that the water can go underneath here, and then it lifts up the whole, uh, the whole structure. Plumbing and electrical connections are all fed through flexible pipes, so the house can rise up to 18 feet. That's as high as the river would get before it overtopped the dike. And here you see how we uh, take care that the house stays in its place. It goes up and down alongside these uh, big poles. Amphibious homes which float only in floods and homes that always float could give rivers room to run and people a place to live. We're now speaking about a concept called hydrometropolis, so a real city in the water. And if you look at the Netherlands from a satellite 100 years from now, I expect that you see lots of water and here and there you see a floating city. It was only after a major flood in the North Sea in 1953 that the Netherlands and other European nations began building their storm barriers. There are similar projects being built near Venice and St. Petersburg, Russia. In New York, Malcolm Bowman hopes their example can be a lesson for cities facing the rising seas and extreme rains of a warming Earth. Even though the threat may seem distant, we should start looking at the engineering designs, looking at the oceanography, we should start doing that now. Next up, 